Hello, I'm Pastor Chuck Sostad, Senior Pastor of Center Points Christian Fellowship. Today we're continuing with our sermon series called Abide in Me. This is the fourth message in our series and it's entitled Abiding in the Result of Love. Now let's begin by examining the realization that abiding in Christ and the love of the family is something that we really need. I mean, I'm grateful that you've chosen to worship with us today because whenever we study the Word of God, when we worship in our songs, everything that we do, when it's according to the Lord, it's worshiping God. And we've been allowing God to do a work in us for the past few weeks as we've learned how to abide in Jesus. Now, the first week we talked about Jesus being the vine and us being the branches. And we stayed connected to Christ in order to live the life that God wants us to live. The second week, we acknowledge that God is a good gardener who knows exactly how to prune our lives in order for us to be free as disciples of Jesus. Now, last week, we discovered every single person will produce some kind of fruit in their lives. It, the question is whether it will be good fruit or bad fruit. But the good news, however, is that as we draw closer to God through repentance, our fruit can change by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, this week, we're going to take a look at the reason why we need to abide in the relationship with Jesus so we can experience the fullness of God. With that being said, here are a few things we can know about God and his love for us by studying the way he ordered families. So let's look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another, in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. <clears throat> now, as families are intimate, so God loves us intimately. Something about sharing living space with someone creates an environment for true relationship. I mean, morning breath, emotional ups and downs, and a variety of other daily occurrences are all experienced together. Our parents, spouses, siblings, etc. know our flaws. They witness our habits and see our most embarrassing moments, and they still love us. Likewise, God wants that kind of family intimacy with us. He wants to know us and show us his love for us. The next thing we need to know, understand is that as family relationships evolve, so does our relationship with God. See, small children see their parents as an unknowable, something unknown, an, an enigma. And how can they enjoy broccoli? I mean, that's a question a lot of little kids will say. Or why do they prefer the movies or news to cartoons? And, and with time and maturity, not only does a child begin to understand their parents more, but soon they begin to trust their parents for wisdom and guidance. I mean, we will never fully understand another human being, much less our infinite God. But over time, we'll become more familiar with his ways and gradually learn to trust and lean on him. And then the third thing is just as families benefit from structure and order, so does our relationship with God. As God-honoring families, we can see that structure and order in relationships is a lovely thing. It's great. Children who don't trust their parents' wisdom and rebel against the parameters suffer under their own direction. Parents who don't use godly discipline with their children allow them to walk into snares. And husbands and wives who deny each other's strengths and weaknesses limit their family's ability to function in the healthiest way. See, likewise, God rules his discipline, his order uh, for our relationship with him serves to create an environment for flourishing. When we deny his leadership and rebel against his rules, not only is our relationship with him strained, but we also heap up trouble for ourselves. I mean, the list goes on and on. And, and God, our father, loves us so much. I mean, very much. I mean, much more than even the best earthly father could ever do. He protects and he provides for us. He creates an environment that promotes growth. And his rules are for our benefit. And he wants us to know and experience his love. The most favorite thing about my family that I can remember is the time that we spent with each other. Experience the love we have for each other brings tears to my eyes. It really does. I, I was thinking about that earlier today. And, and, you know, we didn't have much growing up. But we did have the love for each other. And the time that we spent, I cherish daily. And I look forward to the day when we'll all be together again in heaven. It's made, and that's made possible by the Father, the God who loves all of us. When, when our loved ones pass away, which several of mine have, I look forward to the day that he will bring us all together again. 
So it's important to understand that we need discover, to discover that love is the driving force for connection. You see, love is the glue that holds us together in relationship with Christ. It's the magnet that pulls us together to abide in him. And the reason why we choose to remain connected to the vine, to invite the pruning of God, and to live with a solid assessment of our lives is because we trust God. And we trust God because he loves us fully. And as we're growing in our love for him, it becomes boundless. Our, his love uh, expounds within our, our, our very being. It expands within us. And see, Jesus expounds on this idea in John 15 at the end of the passage that we've been studying. John 15, 9 through 13 says, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. And greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. See, Jesus connects the dots for his listeners as to why they should remain in the connection with him. First, it's because God the Father loves Jesus. Jesus is God's son. He lives in total obedience to the Father. He and the Father are one. Then Jesus states that just as God loves him, he loves us. And the word used by Jesus to express the love is the Greek word agape. Agape is that special kind of love. It's a sacrificial, selfless, and generous love. It's the kind of love that gives without receiving. I've known many people that, that it seems like whenever they get something out of a relationship, they love. But if they don't receive something, they walk away. That's not the case with Jesus. The kind of love that he gives us, it's without him even receiving anything. He wants us to love him, but he loves us just the same. And this word also denotes a choice to love. The choice to love Jesus and Jesus who chooses to love us. I mean, this is the way Jesus loves us because the Father loves him. Jesus goes on to explain the response that we should have to this kind of love. I mean, when we fully recognize that we're loved with an agape love, it's our joy to remain in relationship with him by living obedient lives just as Jesus lived an obedient life here on earth. I mean, this is a choice we have to make. Now, Linda and I have two children. They're grown now, but they have children of their own. And I, I sometimes chuckle a little bit when I see the same thing going on that we had to deal with with our children, them dealing with their children. And if anyone has children of their own, we all know the challenge it can be to have our children obey. Now, some have more problems than others with that. And sometimes they, they don't want to brush their teeth. They don't want to clean their room. They don't want to treat their siblings with kindness. Or maybe they just don't want to do their homework. I mean, it can be maddening. People long for their kids to respond to their instructions. But what is really important is that parents want their kids to respond correctly because the parents want their children to know that they love and care for them and want what is best for them. Loving parents don't want their kids to be robots, though. I mean, they, they, they want them, you know, some kid that doesn't have a will of their own. No, that's not what they want. But instead, they want their children to respond in a matter, in a manner that shows that they choose to obey their parents out of love. We want our kids to respond to us because they know that we love them and they can trust us. That's the only thing that will really cause us humans to remain in a faithful, obedient relationship with Jesus. <clears throat> because knowing we are loved beyond measure and we can trust God and that we can lean on him. I mean, there are some people who may be skeptical. Uh, they may be skeptical that they were truly loved by God or they are truly loved by God. I mean, after all, we've all made mistakes and have been disobedient before. I've had people tell me, I've gone too long. I've gone too far. I've disrespected God. There's no way that God will love me. Let me tell you something. God loves us no matter what. Now, we might wonder if Jesus actually loves us. And Jesus anticipates this. So he gives us a clear indicator that his love can be trusted. That's why he says in John 15, 13, 
Greater love has no one that lays down their life for their friends. Why is that? Because that's exactly what he did for us. We find that the cross is the proof of love. Jesus is pointing to a specific aspect of his life for conclusive proof that we're loved and welcomed into a connection with him. To see this proof, we just need to look directly to his crucifixion and his death on the cross. It's at the cross of Calvary that Jesus laid down his life so that we might have a new life and freedom from sin when we obey his words. You know, he rose from the dead to prove that he is God and that we will have eternal life with him. But his death on the cross was one that showed that he poured himself out that we could be forgiven of our sins. He proves his friendship, his compassion, and agape love by defeating death at the cost of his own life. He died on the cross, but he rose again. He defeated death, but it cost him his life. But why? Why would Jesus do this? What would compel him to pay such a high cost? Well, the motivation of Jesus that sent him to the cross was his love for us. By his actions, he is offering us a relationship with him that gives us the opportunity to become a part of God's family. It's a relationship based on love that causes us to be the best version of ourselves. It gives us confidence and assurance in who we are and who we are and created to be. It calms our fears that we will never be left alone by him. He will always be there for us. You see, Jesus doesn't just tolerate us. He doesn't just put up with us. He doesn't just bear with us. Instead, he loves us and invites him into an abiding relationship with him. The Apostle Paul wrote about this love in his letter to the early church in Ephesus. See, the church was struggling to remain faithful. And Paul knew that the only thing that would change their situation was a proper view of God's love. It says in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 16 through 19, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with the power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. See, Paul's prayer is that the church would be strengthened so that Jesus can abide in their hearts. Not only are we invited to abide in Jesus, but we can be assured that Jesus will abide in us. In fact, James chapter 4, the author makes a strong statement that if we will draw near to God, he will draw near to us. See, we can trust God to do what he says he will do. What does the prayer also state? It states that the church would be rooted and established in love. Love is the soil in which faith grows. It's in abiding in Christ that we can fully grasp how wide, long, high, and deep is God's love for us. It reminds me of when, when our son Jeremy was a little boy, we went on a, a vacation to, to Grand Canyon. We, we stopped there along with other places that we went, and I had seen pictures of this awesome, impressive place, but pictures only show a reflection of it. I mean, pictures are wonderful, but it's not like being there in person. There's no comparison. I mean, sure enough, the width, the length, the height, and the depth of the canyon, it, it took our breath away. It was incredible. But in comparison to that, it pales to God's love. The magnitude of God's agape love is so massive that we can't fully receive it without the power of the Holy Spirit. We can hear about it. We can read about it. But to really know the love of God through the Holy Spirit's drawing us to him, we'll be filled so completely full of God's love that we'll never be the same. Why? Because God's love is greater than we think. We each need to think about this. Is there someone in our life who really loves us or has loved us so greatly? Maybe it was a spouse, a friend, or maybe it is, or it was. A spouse, a friend, a sibling, a parent, a grandparent. Someone that loved us so incredibly and so deep. See, what are the aspects of that love do we most appreciate? 
That love uh, that I can understand is, is called unconditional love. And I know that my mom loved me so much. She suffered many things in her life, uh, but I will tell you, she loved her kids and she did whatever she had to do to keep us together and to keep us going to church and knowing who God is. See, there's nothing that we can do to make a person love us more. And there's nothing we can do to make that person love us less. Unconditional love convinces us that we're loved just because we exist. God loves us because we are his creation. We're a part of his family and he loves us as his children. The scriptures affirm this over and over and over again. 1 John 3, 1 says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. It's as if God knew humans would constantly struggle to believe that they are loved beyond what we can think or imagine. The author of 1 John is empathetic about this by saying, that is what you are. He doesn't want us to miss this life-changing truth. The very foundation of life that God longs for and what he longs for us to have and to enjoy and to embrace begins with this conviction. See, too often we have this intellectually uh, acceptance of it, but in reality, many people have not allowed it into their hearts. Until the love of God makes that 18-inch journey from our heads to our chest, we unfortunately will find ourselves in a struggling connection to Christ. God knows until we see ourselves that the way God sees us and accepts his love for us, we'll be missing the fullness of our life with God. If you've never made that decision, if you've never learned to know the love of God like he wants us to learn it, if you've never leaned into God's love and embraced the life-giving vine, I would like to offer this to you today to do so because it's constant and it's a constant invitation from God that if we ask Jesus into our heart, he will forgive us of our sins and we can become a child of God. So I'm inviting you to pray with me today. Pray with me right now. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. Lord, I confess my sins and, and the lack uh, of believing in your forgiveness. Please forgive me. Help me to reach out to you. I, I acknowledge your great love for me. And please come into my heart as Lord and Savior. Take complete control of my life. Take control and help me to live in connection with the vine. You, Lord Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for saving me and answering my prayer. And I give you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. In your precious name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, I, I do want you to know that if you prayed that prayer today, let me know so I can encourage you to walk in that new relationship with Christ. Those of you that know Jesus, be encouraged today. Understand that God loves us and we are a part of his family. So thank you for joining in with me today for this message. To find out more about Centerpoints Christian Fellowship, visit our website at www.centerpoints.org. On our website, in the narrative on YouTube and Facebook, you can find a link to our YouTube channel with all our video messages recorded so far, including this one. On YouTube, you can go to www.youtube.com forward slash at the symbol uh, CPCF. If you'd like to find out more about how to join us on Wednesday night for our Bible study or the Women's Thursday Morning Bible Study, just send me an email requesting it at info at centerpoints.org. So until I see you again, stay safe and may God bless you and have a great day.